Hello everybody, uh, my name is Ben Barrett, I work at Focus Home Interactive as a creative producer. Today I'm here to show you Other Side, which is a turn-based tactical horror RPG uh, by Lightbulb Crew. And luckily for you and me, um, I have two members of Lightbulb Crew here to tell us all about their excellent game um, and to introduce you to it for the Steam Digital Tabletop Fest, uh, which I hope you're all enjoying. So, uh, Alexandre, Paul, do you want to tell us who you are, what you do, and what this wonderful game you've created is? I'm Alex. I'm the art director on Lightbul at Lightbulb Crew and on the project other side. And so we're super happy to, to see that we're going to have a new stream and that you can get on board on the game. I hope we won't see Ben die too much today. And uh, basically, I chose the colors of the game. So as you can see, black, white, and red. And it's, that's your turn, Paul. Yeah, and I'm Paul Vauvray, and I acted as the lead game designer on the project, and I'm really happy to take a look back at other side uh, for the Steam uh, Tabletop Festival. Yeah, because we, we, we released this, goodness me, when was it now? Like, time has just no meaning. Uh, July 28th. July 28th, so that was yeah. two months ago? Is that right? Yeah, two decades ago, something okay, like that. Yeah. So, somewhere time. between, like, 30 seconds and, and four years ago um, was when that all happened. And... Um, it was super cool to get this out there. This is kind of one of the first games that I was working on from the first moment that I came to Focus, which was super cool. And um, it's it's also just a really cool, you know, super cool project. Um, I think this started with you, Alex. Like, you kind of were the, the brainchild behind it all. Um, so do you want to kind of give us an intro to to what this what this game is? Yeah, so the thing is, the other side is always about contrast. So you have the contrast of the black and white and red, but it's also a contrast on what's going to happen in screen. You're going to be fighting with a group of warriors named the Daughters that are led by the, the mother, this red character that you can see on your screen. Uh, and basically, you're going to try to destroy terrible monsters who are trying to shatter our reality. But this is like the... Uh, first surface of this, uh, the story that we created, and there are really much more to discover by going through the game, discovering a whole psychological universe, uh, either through text or in the environment, in the codex, and all the cherry picks you're going to find into the game, or just by fighting terrible bosses. Remember. And as people may have noticed, um, we skipped the tutorial, which uh, is always a pretty a pretty good start, I think. Um, there's a tutorial that kind of teaches you about the game, it introduces you to the world a little bit, but this idea of kind of playing it, dying and retrying is a big part of the game. So this idea that, you know, um, you'll come back and you'll try it again, you'll try it again, you'll try it again, um, is a large part of that. Um, and it was kind of, it, it's it's a big part of both the, the universe and the actual gameplay, I would say. Yeah, and you, you will really have to, to expect your daughters to die but they will rise stronger uh, over run after run after run because you will be able to uh, resurrect them uh, as uh, as you progress you gain even more possibilities to resurrect them and make them progress and, and they will really become these badass uh, warriors by the end of the game and uh, becoming all the more impressive with new skills and uh, other items that you can keep on those skills that we call the memories uh, and the whole game loop was uh, designed to push you forward even when you fail. And that's really one of the cornerstones of the game. Yeah, it's one of the very interesting parts of Other Side is being at the same time a tactical with a bit of RPG uh, for very hardcore players who want to challenge their brain and find the best way to manage and get out of this nightmare. And at the same time, it has some roguelite mechanics where falling is always falling forward and you get stronger and you get better. So even for just people who want to go through the story, there are uh, a way to always overcome the enemies in the end. And especially in this new mode that you just triggered, Ben, the dream mode that is let's say, slightly smoother for people who are maybe not hardcore challengers in the tactical game genre. And they can find their pleasure by just having the game, let's say, slightly easier uh, with a little addition with this dream mode that is just being updated right now. Yeah, it's kind of one of our first kind of major updates to the game, I guess we'd say. Um, and the goal was, it, it's a difficult game. It's tough, it's hard. Um, that was deliberate, but 
there were there were people that wanted to just enjoy it for the story because there is also a pretty complex a pretty interesting um and a very challenging to get through story in there and some of the biggest feedback we got was hey look this game is cool but god it's hard and we were like well we can you know we can do something about that i would personally say that the the nightmare mode the original mode is um intended i suppose you know that was how you guys designed the game um but you know we're never going to tell people how to play the game if they if they want to play it you know in a little bit easier or in a way that they can enjoy it more or a way that lets them get through it then yeah go ahead do it you know why, why should we stop you yeah exactly and the thinking behind the the dream mode as we call it is not necessarily to only do it easier because i i gotta say the game is still very lethal and if you make mistakes it's still gonna be really hard during a map or a level but the game has these additional options for you to recover from your failures. So you're still intended to, to fail, or failure is still uh, important in the game, but you have many more uh, ways to continue progressing. And that's uh, how we envision that easier game mode. We really no didn't want to uh, uh, neutralize the potential of the enemies and make them like punching uh, bags, you know? So they are still gonna strike hard, but you're gonna manage it much more easily if you make a mistake. I mean, I'm kind of I'm kind of dashing through this first this first mission here. There's probably a lot of stuff that people are seeing that they're not familiar with. I suppose the timeline um, as we jump out here and I'll start to customize it a bit will probably be the I don't know if I call it the major innovation of the game, but it's certainly one of the central bits of the game. Um, is there stuff there that you want to talk about in terms of how you designed it and what the goals were there? Come yeah, sure. Away. So the we'll idea behind the timeline is really to uh, rethink the way turn-based games work. Done. Usually you go but first and then the enemies go and then it uh, follows this kind of really uh, sequential flow. Uh, whereas the timeline offers you ways to play in between. You can have delayed actions that will uh, happen uh, after a certain period of time. Uh, you can have overtime actions that will repeat every, let's say, 15 initiative units. Uh, and you can interrupt enemy attacks or enemy movement and you can react to their movement as well so it creates a really dynamic combat even though it's still a primary at its core a grid based tactical game uh, it really shines and, and becomes much more dynamic and, and impressive by the, the tactics that you can uh, put in place with the timeline. And uh, people will have seen me just kind of upgrading the doors slightly there, um, adding some new skills. We're also now taking a look at the codex. There's a lot of stuff to do between missions. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can customize your doors. And then we have this whole codex, which you'll see. There's kind of the law text, which is the stuff you see in white. And then the gray text, which kind of tells you how enemies act. And this is something that you can use to progress through the game. As you come up against enemies that you can't defeat, you go, oh, okay, well, what about... What, what does the codex say um, and then you're meant to use that to you know defeat enemies now those first enemies we face they're not meant to be super challenging you are meant to be able to beat them fairly easily they're meant to teach you about how the game works um, but it was it's this very careful balancing act that we kind of had to go through throughout development uh, to say how are we going to teach people how this game works and how are we going to give them hints as to what they can do without just you know carrying them through it by the hand yeah yeah exactly and i i remember i think alex will talk about it better than than me but uh at the beginning of the game's production alex used a really powerful phrase uh, that was i want to make a game not an art book and i think that speaks uh, volumes about how the way we designed the game and the way we use the lore and the story and even for small items like the memories you will unlock some pieces of knowledge that help you uh, to go further in the game. And that goes as well with the codex and the enemy descriptions. We really try to leverage every part of the game to create this cohesive experience and not just add stuff because it's always nice to have more stuff, but we really try to do something that made a lot of sense and a cohesive experience. Yeah. It was the, one of the main goals was to always tie up gameplay story and uh, art direction. So everything was at thing well thought with those three three topics in mind and one of the things that has been really for a long time in balance is how much information do we give gameplay wise to the to the player and the more we were seeing that our audience was basically hardcore players who wants to be smart and get good at the game and challenge the very high difficulty the more we knew we had to give them as much information as possible so that's why you can inspect your new the enemy units in the game uh, and see how they're gonna attack and what are the patterns they're gonna have and you'll have also in the codex 
uh, an explanation of what's their behavior or part of their behavior. So the more you're digging into both the gameplay and the lore, the more you're learning about them and you're becoming a better hunter somehow. And you can like smash those small enemies super quickly when you know them. And then you'll have much more dangerous encounters that will come and you'll have to think much more to your build and how you're creating your daughters and how you're customizing your at least your daughter itself but also the whole team together so you can manage those more dangerous encounters afterwards so we're gonna we need a few more different skills here we're gonna show off some of the interruption hopefully some of the combo abilities do you want to talk a little bit about how all that kind of ties into what we were talking about especially with the time yeah, sure. So as we see here, you've triggered an interruption, which which means that the the Clemence, the Soul Slinger, will wait for an enemy attack in in uh, her range. And if it happens uh, during the time where the interruption is active, she will uh, uh, in fact interrupt the enemy attack and provide a counter attack uh, that's uh, really lethal and also helps you or your other daughter uh, save some HP. Uh, and on top of that, you can uh, start to build combos because we have the interruptions, but you also have reactions. And if you start chaining those, you can really have these uh, free-flowing moves where you have several daughters that uh, uh, inflict damage to a single enemy or a bunch of enemies, uh, which uh, makes you feel really smart and powerful, I think. Of course, so after you're... explaining all of that, they uh, didn't attack us, so we didn't uh, Yeah. <laughs> But we, we could see that the two uh, enemies with the pistols over there, they, they prepared some delayed attacks uh, that you can see on the timeline. And if they strike and you didn't prevent them from attacking, they will do a lot of more damage. And so that's that's how you can like try to set up your interruptions or you can just go straight Whatever for the kill that works as well because they're fairly weak, uh, even though they do massive damage. I think we, we, we can see that uh, Clemence has the Red Mother that appears uh, when you use uh, your attack. It's linked to the memories that you uh, attach to her skill. So by killing some of the enemies, you're going to recollect some uh, memories from this Red Mother. And basically, it's kind of upgrades that you can uh, attach or assign to your the skills to your, of your daughter that will invoke some passive bonuses and really change the way the skill is working. And it will make appear this red mother ghost with, when you're attacking with it. And in addition of that, the memories themselves, if you go in the codex, are literally parts of the story of this Red Mother, and it's a long five-chapter story where you can discover a big part of the background of the, the game itself. Uh, other side is, is basically uh, structured like in layers, where you can just have the high level is just challenging the game like an arcade game, and then you can start to dig and get yourself into the itself and discover a bit more all this psychological part and who is your enemy and why are you fighting here and you can get even more uh, in, in the depth of the story and discover all the background of the main characters and why they're tied up together and uh, wh how much there is a, a huge world behind this small uh, window we're showing into the game itself what you saw there just to you know explain for everybody what happened was the delayed action that was the massive shot from the, the final uh, shooter that died went off, but because we had the interrupting round, we interrupted that and shot him and killed him so that you know, he was dead, we didn't get hit, two very good things, um, and also it meant that our daughter could escape and, and do some more things. And also because um, those, a lot of those stances, they cost health rather than... Um, rather than AP, so you can set them up, quite a lot of them up. So if you need a turn where you're going to do a lot of damage, where you're going to be really protected, you can do it, it's just going to cost you health. And that's one of the major ways in which this new game mode also affects the game, because health is a little bit easier to get back in this mode. Do you want to talk a little bit about kind of the balancing of both modes and how it works when it comes to health and what we did there to make it so you could have these really powerful abilities, but you weren't always going to be able to spam them? Yeah, of course. So the idea here was that we wanted to create a an interesting trade-off between like doing these uh, super interesting interruptions, reactions, and so on. Uh, and we we were already in that uh, game where we that we designed as an uh, a roguelite where you need to fail to progress uh, somehow. So 
we, we decided to use the HP as the currency uh, for these uh, specific skills, so the interruptions and the reactions, which means that for each specific daughter, depending on their total HP, you know that you only have so many interruptions that you can trigger before she's really vulnerable and, and super close to dying. Uh, in the dream mode, we introduced a new feature that actually regenerates health when you finish a mission or you go to the next day uh, when we go back to the, to the main uh, menu we, we will see there is a timeline also on the main menu you can go from a, a day to another when you complete a mission and every day you recover a bit of hp which means you recover a bit of uh, possibilities regarding the interruptions and the reactions but that's really designed in a way that creates interesting trades off and pushes your daughters towards death uh, which is one of the really key elements in the game uh, mechanically and in the thematic but there is another way to recover health uh, actually in the nightmare mode this is the only way to recover health is to sacrifice one of your daughters into another to transfer both a bit of their skills uh, as well as their, their remaining health uh, which is a really powerful feature in terms of the obviously the, the thematics of it but also mechanically it's the major way to progress through the game just as you're mentioning it, I made sure that one of my daughters died. It was a deliberate move on my part, not a mistake. <laughs> um, and that means we'll get to see when we get back exactly how that death kind of works into the whole ecosystem of the game. Um, and particularly also how we kind of altered it on dream mode to, again, make it a little bit less punishing, a little bit um, a little bit easier to do exactly what you, what you want to do. In fact, here it is. Yeah, so on the, the dream mode, you May start the, the run with a sure. resurrection token. So it's kind of a, it's a freebie when you do a, a big Read mistake and you lose your first daughter. Night. It's it's all right. You can resurrect the, her in the cemetery. Uh, but if you do it over and over Remember again, you will have courage. issues because uh, resurrection tokens are in short supply in the world of other side and you will have to find them as you progress. So right now you just uh, resurrected one of the daughters that uh, died uh, in the previous mission. It also works when you uh, sacrifice one of your daughters and if she's really more powerful than the others, she will g give you a really huge power boost. So, and it's related to their class as well. So it uh, goes into this like meta game approach of trying to optimize your daughters and trying to figure out the combinations that are the most powerful. Let's say if you uh, sacrifice a really uh, powerful blade master she will Ever give onward. damage boosts to your soul slinger for instance and then your soul slinger can really become a, a towering cannon that uh, takes down a lot of uh, enemies because she gains uh, so much more damage from from her take away sister. his tools of torture that's one of the very interesting things we saw when the game went out and even through the the beta testing that we had is how many the different way to play with it, our players found to, to go through no, the adventure of, of the side mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. some are building super uh, super sharp teams with all the classes and some others are just using the soul slingers and the blade masters or full soul slingers or full shield bearers and they always find a new technique and some people are or players are starting with oh, how difficult it is i always want to resurrect my first row uh, roster of daughters because they're my favorites and some others are like oh i'm i'm basically always germinating and doing the hybridation between all my daughters to optimize my team so i have no problem sacrificing them for the the bonuses that i can win and it's really interesting to see with the basic of the same game and the same rules there are so many different ways to outcome the game and try to tackle with all the challenges that they, that's in the game itself and i mean that's what we want right like i'm sure there i'm sure there is an optimal way to play on the side there's a way that it's more likely to get you to you know to the victory or, or whatever your goal is for, for that particular game but there's also a lot of different fun ways to play it. There's a lot of different ways that can depend on, oh, you know, I, I prefer playing with this style of, of character. Oh, I prefer these classes. I like the look of them or whatever it is. Um, and also, you know, down to the individual decisions and, and happenstance that you've had on your run. Did someone in your run die early? And so you ended up playing with two Blade Masters because you didn't have a Soul Slinger, that kind of thing. Um, so it, it feels like it's a very kind of open game that lets you sort of do 
whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and there's probably an optimal way to do it, but because there's like a certain amount of random chance in there, you can sort of, you know, you, you can play your way. Yeah, and actually we, we discovered with the guys who are in our Discord for other side and after the release of the dream mode uh, that we, we beta tested, uh, that actually the hardcore players had fun with the dream mode itself because it could kind of allow them to try new stuff that it was not the most optimized thing that their brain was uh, pushing them to use in any <laughs> circumstances. And so they could like start to experiment and even some guys were saying, I, basically I was took another skill because this skill was so good for my super powerful team and try I tried this one and I discovered a new combo and I was like super happy to discover and to try a new kind of type of ty of team in the game and so I think even for the hardcore players they can have another way to f uh, to rediscover uh, other side through the dream mode with something that's maybe yes less punishing but uh, open opening for them some new doors of uh, fun and uh, testing uh, through the game, through the skills, through the ma min-maxing of their characters. Let's talk a little bit more about art. Um, the whole game is in black and white and red. Uh, and not that much red, let's be honest. Um, bitter victory. Why? Why did you do that? What was, what was the purpose, Alex? I was super lazy. That's yeah. that's some of the comments that we received. Like you, you use less colors, so that was easier. And actually, that's maybe the worst answer ever. <laughs> absolute opposite of the truth, believe me. Because it's like yeah, exactly the absolute opposite. All all the artists knows how difficult it is to tackle with so so few colors and the contrast of a black and white and the lizability for a gameplay in black and white. But as I said, and as Paul mentioned, we were really we wanted to have other side to strike out of the the other tactical genre uh, games that we can down. have, and get a bit far away from something that's more sci-fi, military, yes, commander uh, uh, type. So we created a whole world that's very uh, ethereal and that's in between dreams and nightmares. Uh, that's stuck into between two realities and black and white came along this process because it's kind of depicting this very weird universe very really n noir uh, and so it kind of tied up both the lore and uh, the visual aspect that we wanted and actually it came along also when we were in the process we discovered that some people were actually dreaming exclusively in black and white and so it kind of like worked well, when we discovered this, we we're like shocked. It was oh, this is kind of tying up everything and saying the destiny is saying we're on the good way. So we sticked to it. It was not a, di a very easy choice, especially. I'm uh, sorry, Paul, for all the UI problems that it it was uh, <laughs> bringing for us, and we really we had to to tackle with very difficult uh, balance between so much information to put in a tactical game and sticking to we just have three colors and a few. Values to to make it all uh, coherent into this art direction of black and white. But yeah, it's uh, in other side everything is a bit uh, further than what you can expect. If you look closely to the, to Clemence, you see your uh, HP bar is a bit lower, and actually the red scarf that's tied around her neck is graying out. The same for Cynthia. So. It's small hints that are showing that the universe itself is uh, tied up with the gameplay, tied up with the lore. This red vivid color is also the representation of those. Uh, this red mother who gave birth to, to the daughters. They are the only characters bringing color in this dark and white uh, uh, world. It's something very precious and actually it's also the the color of the blood and so the life that we're taking off. It's also the color of the currencies, the vitae that you're using to make them born again, of the skills, of the memories that you're gathering. So we really try to have something that's uh, harmonious from the beginning to the end and each time you you would just try to, put, to ask yourself why have they put this in the game. There is also a kind of lore uh, envisaging who's going to come, or there is a reason always behind. It's interesting you mentioned the UI. Um, I remember how many, you know, stuff like the timeline system, which we already talked about a little bit, 
that took so much effort to get right because there really just isn't a ton of stuff that's like that out there particularly where we decided to place it on the screen the amount of importance that it may, had within the game slow suffering's uh, it was just you know, it was very very difficult to, to the danger passes uh, find the correct we way to do that um, and next. i think i think we ended up in a good spot but what it's certainly been, has this you know, there's a lot of stuff covered. over the course of development that has gone back and forth and finding the right the right way to do something um and at the end of the day honestly i mean you know i think we ended up in a pretty good spot i hope you guys do too um and and we definitely we've definitely made something that's that's unique and one of the first things i ever said when i was i was thinking about other side was no one's ever ever going to mistake other side for a different game they're never going to think, oh, is that, is it, is it XCOM? Is it, um, is it, is it one of the other tactical games that's out there? No, it's, it's black and white. It, there's a dash of red. There's horrific monsters. It's definitely the other side. Yeah, it was even one of the main, main goals of the mission that we had, uh, both me or Paul or any part of the team, is that at each screenshot that you see from other side, would it be an artwork or an in-game shot or a gameplay uh, view? People have so to recognize that is on the side and made by Live Up Crew and not some any other game that could have been made. And so we stick to it at least. And even if it's not a revolution in all the the aspects of the game itself, I think we kind of succeeded. So people can just recognize it's the game and that's nothing else. What we do is a mercy to the world. Who's this a guy? mercy. So now you you just met our terrible surgeon, who is uh, the the first boss of the game. So you have this that? structure through eras, and you are going from day to day up to an ultimate day at the end of the seventh day, where you'll have to to fight this guy who appeared into the the background of the strategy map. So. Uh, in addition to be a very dangerous foe, he is very linked to the lore itself. So you'll discover by by playing the game that you're going to be kind of hunting this character named the Child, a twisted character with a mask on his face and who is basically breaking the world. And all the part of his traumatisms are or traumas are coming from those bosses that you're going to be fighting for. And the surgeon especially is really one of the most uh, hideous one. He is a kind of a twisted version of a plague doctor. So those doctors that were uh, they will fall. working in the 13th century against the, the, the plague that were uh, going through the Europe and in, uh, in France especially and he is like a horrible vision of those guys of the all the the corrupted science and uh, doctors that you could what find into the world that all the agglomerated end. into one horrible uh, abomination so he has this long beak mask that's uh, typical from the plague the doctors but also continue. like uh, dozens of scissors planted in his back and a huge twig blade that is actually a doctor scissor or surgery scissors so yeah that's that's you're jumping into one of the mission of the well into the battle against the boss one very important thing is if you lose you're gonna lose your run or you're gonna lose your recollection so it is a very difficult fight Maybe you'll succeed, but I'm not really sure for I, now. I, 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 we'll see. We'll see. I'm definitely doing it the, worst, the, uh, the hardest possible way. But I figured, you know, I, I think the boss fights are... Other side is good. Other side's boss fights are great. You know, like, other side, good game. Other side's boss fights. This is where everything comes together. You've got to use that timeline system. You've got to know exactly what they're going to do. You've got to be able to to predict them you're going to see lots of cool stuff that you only see in the boss fights they've got unique arenas unique music um yeah you know this is where the game comes alive so it's definitely something i want to show off on this on the stream yeah, it's really good. something we designed around uh, we also aimed for that kind of feeling so that's great that you're mentioning it we really designed the boss fights as one of the cornerstones of the the game and in terms of pacing everything revolves around this that's why we have several eras and at the end of each era the boss fight is mandatory whether you're ready or not you're gonna have to fight that uh, abomination and we we tried uh, as much as possible to design them and, and make a balancing for each boss fight in a way that the first time you encounter them you're simply not ready you could overcome them if you're really good or lucky uh, but 
Yeah, the game is designed in a way that the first time you're gonna fight them, usually you're gonna get your ass kicked. And then the second time with what you learned and the uh, second playthrough, uh, through I more missions, we may be resurrecting your, your daughters from the previous run, you will be uh, ready or more ready uh, to, to take them down. And that creates a, a kind of anticipation because the first time, if you really got uh, wrecked by the boss, you will be awaiting eagerly the second time to see if you are ready or not. Most of the time you will be, um, but that makes for memorable uh, fights, I think. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Do you want to speak a little bit about the specifics of this fight? You know, I could open his menu and show it all there, but um, since I've got you on the line, I figured you, you, uh, you can take us through what we're trying to do in this fight um, and what I'm doing wrong, especially. Yeah, we, we are not trying to, to say too much because I think one of the the things that make this boss special uh, because it's the first one you encounter but also because of his patterns and the way it's designed uh, i don't want to spoil everything but basically what you can see here is that the boss uh, is helped with a, a bunch of minions that will increase his armor and so as long as you don't really take them down they will keep making the boss like this huge fortress of scissors basically because he cannot take any damage uh, unless you have really really powerful daughters from later eras and you come back and you redo a whole run but in the beginning of the game you're just not power powerful enough to go through his armor so you will have to take down these acolytes uh, one by one before you can really handle the threat of the boss in the meantime though he is targeting your daughters so it's a game of cat and mouse between you and the acolytes and between the, the surgeon and your daughters and if you really uh, think it through it can work but the first few times when you encounter that and you're targeting the acolytes you really have to be careful because the surgeon has a massive range of movement and if he catches a daughter out in the open it's uh, just basically over so and then if you succeed in doing that you will push the boss into the phase two of the fight and then you will see that he unlocks more skills and he plays a bit differently uh, and he can actually take more damage also so he's weaker uh, in terms of the, the armor he has but uh, he's uh, stronger and, tr and strikes more powerfully and, and with the new skills he unlocks and we saw a little bit of all the tools that you could have when in your team of daughters, like interruptions, reactions, and everything. The thing is, of course, if you start to project yourself, those tools are very powerful, but what's happening when they are in the hands of the enemies itself, and especially the bosses, depending on which boss you are, uh, can handle some of your, those tools okay. themselves for killing your daughters. And so that's where all the strategy is getting even more interesting, because uh, how do you fight against your own weapons uh, somehow and how you deal with the reactions of uh, the uh, boss or how do you do when he is interrupting you at each time and that's uh, where there is the whole flavor of outcoming some super hard challenge where you have really to think uh, and try to think in advance and then what's your next play so you can do it uh, smartly and kill the, uh, the enemy and you just entered the second phase where he's going completely berserk and super super lethal. So just be careful to those AOE attacks that <laughs> see here. Yeah, well, the red skull is not a good sign. <laughs> let's find out. I sure it's fine. So that's what happens when you're unprepared, as mentioned. Well, at least one survived. Yeah, they were okay. Yeah, the shield bearer can take a few hits because she's usually the, the stronger one of the group. The soul slinger <laughs> is not. Oh, she's okay. uh, right. It's just a little haircut, but be careful for the second second one. Let's, let's get out of that. That seems bad. So yeah, because it is a day, delayed action, so you can see down here that it's going to be active in 24 units, so you can just manage and get out of it. If, if uh... I guess one of the key mechanics that we haven't mentioned yet is the flanking and the backstabbing. You may have seen it uh, in the in the run because I think in the back in the previous turns uh, you flanked the boss. Yeah, this is one of the keys to unlock, uh, especially for the the enemies with a lot of HP. When you attack them from the flanks or uh, in the back, you will do much more damage. 
So you will have to figure out ways to uh, make these bigger enemies target one of your loaders so that the others can move around and, and flank or backstack them. Backstack them. You're actually doing pretty okay. Considering I immediately lost the daughter, I would agree. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair fight. It's not having any it's of this game, so. You attacked the fourth day, right? Yeah, when, yeah. Uh, I, went, I went in there immediately. Because, there. because that's one of the things. We, we um, revealed the boss on the fourth day, but you still have up to the seventh day if you just want to train yourself or uh, get some more experience for your daughters or gather more memories but on the seventh day you're forced to fight against the boss and you just jumped in it all <laughs> the first day <laughs> and also on, on new runs after this one because I, i'm pretty sure you're going to lose this fight <laughs> the boss is available from the first day uh, of Mera, so it's easier if you want to speed run it and you can just resurrect your team and go straight to the, to the boss. One of the key things that I think this is showing semi deliberately, but also I was trying to, I promise, um, is just what happens if you let, if you take too many actions at once, you go to the first window, and it means you take longer to, to get your next action, right? So, what that has allowed the boss to do here is he took a lot of turns in a row. Um, and that's essentially what killed me in the end, is I didn't have the time between his attacks to get out of the way and to escape. Um, so there you see, that's what happens when you lose. Let this loss be not be our epitaph. And because you've uh, accomplished a few missions, when you lose your first recollection, you will collect a resource we call shards. Alas, and these shards allow you to born. equip remembrances, which are run we have specific Let's say power ups that you can equip, so you can have more damage so for your daughters, or you can again. have a, another re, uh, resurrection token, for instance. And the further you progress uh, in the game, the more rec uh, remembrances you will unlock. So you will gain more power. Uh, so that that's the remembrances screen. You have a free one that's the the eyeball, and then you activated also the shimmering blood that's uh, plus 15 percent health points that's quite a lot in our game already and then you can unlock a variety of other powers like that and that these the shards the only way to collect them is to conclude a run which is key to failing forward in a sense and you could always, um, you will have seen it when we were on the initial page, I think you'll see it right here, in fact, you could always decide, okay, you know what, I'm done with this run, I, I'm not going to beat the boss, or I've got I've, I've got whatever goal I went for with this, let's get, let's just go to the next recollection. So here you see it, it tells me how many shards I'm going to get, I'm not going to get any, because I haven't done the thing. You see which recollection you're on up here, um, and then basically we're back into the game. We, now we have two resurrection tokens, we'll also start with a couple of uh, memories, which are Drill and Rush, um, and also now we actually we know a bit about the surgeon. So that's useful to know because it means we can go into the codex, we can have a scroll down, and now we can see what the surgeon does. Awesome. And you can resurrect the daughters that lost the fight. Yeah, exactly. Well. So then we can also head over to the cemetery, so here Remember are our their last courage. Time. Now Clement's already got resurrected once, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna leave her in the bit. But we can bring back Sincere and our other daughter as well. And now, and now we also have a bigger team. Well, having a bigger team means is we can, you know, let's make another daughter as well. Give life to our daughters. We'll randomize the name a couple of times. I like Deuce. Please and then we know we're missing a soul slinger, as well. it says here. So yeah, sure, let's make her a soul slinger. And then we have this team of six. Now you will have seen that most missions have a, a max of three. Now, but unleash her often you'll have more than one sign that you're available to go to. So this also means that you can do double the number of missions. It means you're going to get more rewards. You're going to have more shards that you're gathering. You're going to have more vitae. That means you can put in more memories. You're going to be gathering more memories from doing more missions. So all this stuff kind of builds up over time. Um, it is possible to beat the surgeon on your first run. I think if I'd gone to day seven, if I'd played super careful, careful, I probably could have done it. Obviously, I fought this boss a few different times to be, to be, uh, uh, you know, little about it. But as you as you go along, you're probably going to get to a point where you need to reset. But then there's lots of different ways you can start in later eras. You can make the game a little bit easier for yourself. You can have your daughter starting at a higher level. And there's lots of different options you have there to shape how you want to do a run. Uh, even without doing any spoilers, but more like a, 
some challenge for the players or those who are listening. We already had that sit the first players who finished in the first recollection the whole game. Oh, they've done it. I was so, wondering if that happened yet. Yeah, it, it, it did happen. Actually, finishing in one recollection is possible. Okay. Uh, we finishing on the very launch. first one, it's never not yet very easy. <laughs> not at all easy, but the yeah. best players, that's it. They outcome this uh, this difficulty. So well, it is cool. possible. It is possible. That's super cool. Okay, well, I think we've kind of shown what other side is. There's loads more to the game. Um, there's four more eras. There's four more super cool bosses. There's loads of different enemies, loads of skills you can learn. Um, there's even a couple of secrets in there that we don't like to spoil, but some very cool stuff. And if you pay attention to a few trailers we've released, you may have you may have seen some of the secrets that are in there. Um, it's available on Steam. It's available on Xbox. It's available on PlayStation. It is now available on Nintendo Switch, I believe. Yep. Excellent. I didn't <laughs> couldn't remember if it was out or not yet. It's out, yeah. Since yeah, two, it's two out. weeks. Two weeks. Well, there you go. Um, so you can pick it up on pretty much whatever platform you have that plays games in the modern era. Um, it is, of course, available as part of the Steam Digital Tabletop Fest that's uh, going on right now. So we hope you're enjoying that. Um, there is not a tabletop version of Other Side, I'm sad to say. I'd love to own little plastic figures of a lot of the different characters on Other Side. Uh, but we do think it plays a little bit like a, a board game. It's got a little bit of that feel. Um, and we hope you enjoy it if you enjoy board games or even if you don't. Um, guys, is there anything, you know, anything else about the game, about... You know how this came together how you feel about it now that it's been out for a little while we've released on switch we've kind of released some major patches it's it's certainly you know it, it, it's as much of a game as, as we would expect it to be at this point or not yeah i will i will go i don't know what happened with alex i was kind of waiting for him to to go but uh, since he's the art director. Uh, on my end, it was a really tremendous adventure uh, on the human level uh, with the team at uh, Lightbulb Crew and also at Focus. Uh, I think we had a really good uh, working relationship and we uh, had uh, to do a lot of difficult choices to, to make the game come out on uh, these many platforms and uh, when it released with the, the pandemic and so on. So it was kind of a wild ride and seeing the critical reception and the player reception because uh, we also really uh, uh, enjoy the, the feedback that players have, have given us uh, since the release. I think we, we are really proud of what we made. And, and even if it's uncompromising and it was super difficult and we in, uh, introduced a new mode for uh, to increase the accessibility of the game for other players, I think we're really, really uh, proud of what we released and, and uh, have enjoyed the, the special moment when you just, you know, let the... Uh, the work uh, into the wild and now it's not in our hands anymore and, and we can only watch people and the way they think about it and so far we are really pleased by the reception and um, yeah I think uh, we cover the the basics let's say I think uh, as you said there's plenty more to to figure out and find out about the game when you start playing it you will uh, discover many secrets and we hope that each of these bosses uh, will give you a hard time, but you will enjoy it and you will enjoy taking them down, whether it's on the first recollection or the tenth recollection, uh, because uh, it's uh, it should be worth it uh, in the end. So, yeah. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Alex, have we, have we got you? Yeah, sorry. Do you guess who is the lazy di hard director who was muted and speaking alone without seeing his screen that he was muted <laughs> of course it was me uh, so I, yeah i completely i completely agree with paul it was a great adventure it was my first adventure as an art director i was kind of art director junior when i started now i think it took so many years in my life that is <laughs> for sure getting a senior and uh, even for I'll talk for the behalf of the, all the art team where we had so much uh, so much love put into this game so much personal things also on my stand there were a lot of backstories and even uh, symbolisms in the game that are from my personal story and one of the small victories that we had is so many players that wrote to us afterwards saying that they uh, completely understood the lore, digged the lore in its entirety, or even some who kind of discovered the backstory that they that we hid into the game, uh, and completely got into a kind of resonance with us about the true themes that are behind the the fighting uh, surface of the game itself. 
Uh, and that's basically also part of why I'm doing video games. It's not only just for the enthusiasm and entertainment. Of course, it's the most important, but it's for those little moments where some some players can really get into a resonance of what we created uh, us as artists and that they felt the same emotions that we wanted to put in the game itself. And so for all this, uh, the side is a bit of our baby and we we gave him as much love as possible and we hope the players will do as well. well I think that's, that's a great mo moment to end on. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining me on this, this short stream. I hope all of you have enjoyed as well. Um, there will be much more coming from Focus over the coming months, years, decades, millennia. Um, hopefully we won't summon any nightmare creatures from beyond the realm of reality, but we'll see. We're doing our best. Um, <laughs> Lightbulb crew themselves, of course. Many more games to come from them as well, I would hope. Um, thank you very much for joining us, everybody. We will see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you.